When we talk about human history, usually, typically, we have this idea that human history has been around for about 6,000 years. In fact, we associate it with the forms of writing that Western culture recognizes. And these forms of writing are often associated with what Western culture calls civilization. All of this, you know, concept of civilization, something we're going to talk about in this lecture here. But the idea is human history doesn't just go back 6,000 years. It extends far back into the past um, from 200,000 to 400,000 years. And anthropologists are extending that time period all the time as they find new sites or develop new techniques for, for more accurate techniques for dating. So this idea that human history has only been around for 6,000 years, um, really is just taking a look at a part of human history that's a drop in the bucket compared to our vast experiences, human, modern human beings on this planet. And in fact, it favors that idea of a 6,000 year old history, favors the history of civilizations. Again, we'll talk about that problematic term in this lecture. Um, and it ignores, you know, all the other histories that are out there. And in fact, Europe itself doesn't have a 6,000 year old history of civilization, which most people assume it does. Its history with civilization only goes back about a thousand to two thousand years, depending on where you're at. So again, there is so much to human history that we ignore. And in fact, we call anything before the written word as Western culture recognizes it prehistory as though it doesn't even count towards history. So this lecture is a bit of an attempt to correct that error. And it's also much of an attempt to try to um, help us understand the vast expanse of human experience on this planet, modern human experience on this planet, to help us really understand what's happening today and what has brought us to the situation where indigenous peoples around the world are having to stand up and protect their land from these um, invasions that are, are, are threatening their homelands and uh, collectively put together are threatening the entire planet. So a bit of a visual timeline about what I just talked about there. For over 200,000 years, like I said, anthropologists are saying 200,000 to 400,000 years that modern humans have been around, and they keep pushing that date back ever further. For over 200,000 years, we have lived as human beings in small scale, what are called, some people call small scale societies or tribes. These were small communities, um, largely family based, and uh, they were based on the land, family based and based on the land. So we'll be talking about the concepts of all our relations, uh, which applies not only to human beings, but to those beings who are other than human, um, the non-human beings that are out there. and. When you come from a tribal society where you are very family and land based, you understand where that idea of looking at all of creation as your relative comes from. You feel very connected. Uh, you know those beings that are all around you. So these communities tended to be very caring communities, tended to be very close knit communities, and tended to be very ecologically aware communities. We'll talk more about their characteristics in a little bit here. But these tribes, small scale societies have been around for 200,000 to 400,000 years and many exist to this day. And many more people who have been in these small scale tribal societies and experienced colonialism and have had those societies greatly undermined or devastated. Many of those people are working very hard to reclaim what those tribal societies were, those tribal ways of doing things. So there's there's a very strong tribal presence in the, in the um, 21st century as well. About 6,000 years ago, we have the development of large scale societies or what are called um, by in, in our common parlance civilizations. Uh, these civilizations or large scale societies are different from the small scale tribes, small scale societies or tribes in that they are city based. This is where you start to see in some cultures the emergence of cities or concentrations of populations in a particular place. Um, and from there, you see a marked difference between these large scale societies and small scale societies, between civilizations and tribal societies. And we'll talk all about what that means in a minute because in our contemporary American culture, we look at it as bad to be thought of as uncivilized. And I want to explain to you why um, many people are saying being uncivilized is what we need to be. So we'll all talk about that in, in this whole lecture too. And then finally, on this time scale, 
we aren't only in a city-based society here in contemporary America um, in what you know we're, we're going to refer to as a civilization. We're in a global scale industrial civilization both in contemporary uh, America and around the world. Global scale industrial civilization is just that industrial civilization that has spread across the planet. And this is a very, very recent development in human history. But because we are living in it, we feel as though it's the only way to be. We feel there is no other way to live comfortably and happily um, because it's the only thing we know, most of us know. It's the only thing most of us know. And our limited experience keeps us from imagining other ways of being, keeps us from understanding that there have been thousands of years of living in different ways and living in um, actually happier ways and certainly much more ecologically balanced ways. This global scale industrial civilization is very young. It's only been around for about 200, 250 years. And of course, this society, this global scale industrial society is an extraction based society, as we will talk about in this lecture too. So I want to give like a visual here to give you an idea of what the human experience has been like. It has not been, as many of us think, stuck as we are in our personal experience in the 21st century, that industrial humans are all that can ever be because that's all that we have ever known. But in reality, um, industrial human beings are very new. And as you can see, our vast experience, our, the greatest experience we have uh, is as human beings living in tribal societies that, as we'll see, characteristics tended to be um, very caring societies, very supportive societies, um, but also e very ecologically balanced and sustainable societies. In fact, anthropologists will say, and I'll probably repeat this more than once, anthropologists will say our tribal societies are the only uh, sustainable societies we have that we know of in human history. Tribal societies are the only sustainable societies we know of in human history. And the good news is, this is what our vast experience has been as human beings. So when we're looking to sit, looking for solutions and we feel stuck where we're at as though there can be no other way, think of this image and realize, yeah, there is another way. And it's been what we've been living as human beings for more than 95% of our existence. So I want to go over some dates of the first modern humans on the various continents. This is according to Western anthropology and archaeology, you know, their dating methods and the sites that they are finding. And like with human history as a whole, um, the tendency has been for the presence of modern humans, the dating of the presence of modern humans on these different continents to be kept getting pushed back further and further. So the dates you see here tend to be more conservative dates. Um, and those dates keep getting pushed back further into the past. So in Africa, we have had uh, modern human beings inhabiting Africa according to uh, these different archaeological sites for over 200,000 years, and easily that's been pushed back to over 300,000. And again, some anthropologists are saying um, even as much as 400,000 years ago that modern humans have been living in Africa. In Asia, uh, modern humans have been living in Africa or in living in Asia for over 70,000 years. In Australia, the commonly accepted number is 60,000, but there are sites over there that indicate um, people, modern humans have been living in Australia for over 120,000 years. Um, in Europe, there right now the numbers, the dates are that modern humans have lived in Europe for about 40,000 years. And here on Turtle Island and in South America, that is North and South America, the most commonly accepted date in archaeology remains at 12,000 to 18,000 years, but there are people um, such as Paulette Steves and others who are starting to expose this date as saying this is really a colonial mindset and they've talked about how American archaeology um, even as all these other continents are pushing the dates back further with their, with their archaeological research, in the Americas, archaeologists have, who push the date back with the, with the finds that they find, find they lose their jobs, um, they aren't, their, the research projects aren't funded, and there's all sorts of things that are happening with this. Um, Paulette Steves writes a great book called The Indigenous Paleolithic, and in that she explores numerous sites that really date uh, humans uh, in North America and South America back far, far, much further than 12 to 18,000 years 
There was a recent find in New Mexico, for example, that made headlines as over 20,000 years old um, human footprints that are older than the mammoth footprints that are there. They're in an older layer. Uh, and she points out these other sites that take people back 30,000 years, the very strong evidence in various sites for that. And she also points out she has really strong evidence for humans inhabiting, modern humans inhabiting North America back 100,000 years. And then there are sites like the Calico site out in California, um, where very famous anthropologists such as Louis Leakey had been part of the dig and the dating out there. Um, and Leakey supported very old dates of the Calico site. I don't know exactly how old he, he was supporting. Uh, he passed away in 1972, but research was published in the 1980s that was talking about dating that had shown the site to be 200,000 years old. So there's a lot of research that needs to be done here in the Americas that isn't happening. Um, I hope times are changing now, but for a long time, funding what people said on the funding, people uh, just stopped doing uh, or weren't, weren't being given the funding to look into older dates in, in the Americas or their reputations were suffering if they looked into older dates in the Americas. So a lot more work needs to be done there, but there's a lot of intriguing and very interesting possibilities. Um, at any rate, the 12,000 year old arrival of Native Americans to uh, Turtle Island or the Americas is pretty much been blown out of the water. People did arrive, of course, 12,000 years ago across that Bering Land Bridge, um, but people were already here. Uh, there's many, many confirmed and accepted sites that date people back in 18,000 years, 20,000 years, 22,000 years. And of course, as I mentioned, there are many sites that go back even older than that. Um, but for now, a, a safe bet is to say around 20,000 years. That's, that's pretty commonly accepted, is my understanding, in anthropology and archaeology for modern human habitation of the Americas. But always keep in mind, there are many older sites that push that date back much further. One of the things I want to talk about is the way in which human societies organize their ability, the, the power that individuals um, have or where the power rests in a particular society because it depends on what kind of culture you are in. In our contemporary American culture, we tend to think that um, power can only exist one way. We, our histories are all filled with histories about large scale societies or city based societies. So we don't even realize our experience has been that there isn't another way of having power organized in society. We think the only way to do it is a kind of dog eat dog world where the most powerful come out on top and the rest of us just have to figure out how to, how to deal with it. But that's not been our experience as human beings for most of our existence here on this on this planet. So I want to talk about how anthropologists uh, as a general idea take a look at how human societies both today and over time have organized access to power within their societies. One way that social power has been um, defined, you know, the access to power is just domestically right from the household. This is where the power to make decisions rests in the people who live in the household. It rests in the family. So in the film Ancient Futures by anthropologist uh, Helena Norberg Hodge, she talks about how the women of the household, even if they're not participating in councils or these group meetings and decision making um, procedures, the women of the household have a lot of power and a lot of influence over what the community makes uh, for its decisions because the power, the respect for the women is centered right there in the household and they're given a lot of respect and credence of what their feelings are about how things should be happening in the community. Um, so you have the, the, yeah, the decision makers right in the household and then you also have the men in that, in that film Ancient Futures in Ladakh where they meet together as groups to make come to decisions about the community. Um, but again, it's coming right from the household and people meeting with other households to decide, well, what should our community do? So the power is situated right there, right in the household. The family is the one that makes that decision. It's not distant institutions that are making decisions on high and then enforcing them on the people. These decisions are coming right from the heart of the community, those families who make up that community. 
This sort of uh, organization of access to power you will find in small scale societies or tribes, tribal societies. This, they are small. They, and because they are small, people are able to have access to this, this, uh, this decision to, or this power to make decisions. A second way that access to power is organized in human society is politically. Now, this is probably the way most of us in contemporary America are, are used to. This is where the power to make decisions rests in the hands of governmental elites. While we may have a decision in who is our representative in these governments, and in some societies, people don't have that, that, that power to make that decision, it's a small drop in the bucket as to actually, who actually represents us. So we don't have a real close connection to these decision makers. So governmental elites make decisions for us and then we're expected to follow or deal with um, whatever the ramifications of those decisions are. You find the situating of access to power in a political manner, you find that present in large scale societies or nation states or what other people might call civilizations. And again, we'll be talking about that word. Finally, um, what the, the third major way that human societies have organized access to power is commercially or economically. This means that the decision makers are not so much even the governmental elites, but the economy rules all. And you will hear people over and over again, I think you hear this in contemporary America, that what is good for the economy is what must sway decisions. What is good for the economy is what must shape policy. So the economy, even as a non human non-living entity comes to be the most powerful decision maker in that society. You find this sort of organization of power, this placement of power in the hands of this non-entity, the economy, in global scale societies um, and what we call corporatocracies or corporocracies, all of which we'll talk about in a bit. Okay, so let's take a look at small scale societies. Small scale societies are tribes, again, like we mentioned, 200,000 plus years. Anthropologists saying 200,000 to 400,000 and keep pushing that back. This is how long tribes have been around. Tribes are around today. Um, and, you know, we have tribal societies that have been colonized and are trying to become tribal societies again. We also have tribes like some of the uncontacted people in the Amazon or people who are living on islands off the coast of India who are keeping their traditional tribal ways very much alive and don't want to have anything to do with the colonizer society that's like panting at the gates out there kind of so to speak. Um, the seat of power for small scale societies you will find the that that access of power the seat the, the seat of power is in the household and the community uh, families, it's a very family-based society. Um, clans are, are very important here. Clans connect the different communities together um, and they connect the different families in the different communities together. So if you're in one clan and you make, you're traveling someplace else and you don't know anybody in that community, you let those people know what clan you're from and that the clan members in that community will take care of you kind of idea. So it's a very family-oriented, very community-oriented community society. Some of the key defining characteristics, according to anthropologists, of tribal societies or small-scale societies. Again, they are small, family, um, or clan-based. Um, they are very egalitarian, meaning everybody, there's a lot of respect for everybody, a lot of respect for the fact that individuals have visions that they follow that other people may not understand. Everybody has access to power. Um, in the sense that everybody participates in the decision-making process. There's, there might be different ways that this is expressed. Uh, you know, it may not be that every single person sits down in a circle and makes a, makes, has a voice in the decision that's being made directly, but there are different ways that people are listened to and respected and paid attention to. Everybody's got a direct connection to what actions their community takes, what actions um, will that they that they make those decisions on what they do as a community. Um, everybody's looked after. Uh, you'll find so many different cases in tribal societies. Let's go back here a second. Where you know generosity is so highlighted. I guess that's that right there. Generosity is so highlighted. Uh, the person who gives away the most is the one who's most respected. And this idea also helps to make sure that everybody in a community is looked after. So somebody who maybe doesn't fish as well or hunt as well as others, maybe doesn't have as much food as the others, they're looked after. And, and other gifts that they have to offer 
um, will come into play for the community, right? So everybody is paid, but everybody is made sure that they have, if there's enough food to eat, if, if there's any food to eat, if there's shelter, clothing, um, nobody goes without. Everybody is looked after kind of idea. So generosity is really key. Generosity is really key. So is reciprocity, the idea that if you take something, you give something back. So this applies a lot to if you're going out and you're harvesting something or you're hunting, you always recognize that you are taking something from the earth or you're actually taking a life. And you want to make sure that in, and there are different kinds of ceremonies or different sort of philosophies and that vary from culture to culture. And, but the idea is when you're taking a life or when you're harvesting something, you recognize that you can't, you don't have the right to just take. You don't have that privilege. You're, you're not entitled to just take whatever you want. You are taking a gift that's being offered by that animal or by that plant and you want to respect that gift. And so you give something back and you only take, um, you know, you take things in an honorable way. There's something called the honorable harvest we'll talk about later in another lecture. But this is all about being generous as a person, um, never being a taker, always being somebody who's giving something back when you do have to accept gifts from the earth or others. And the earth in this same vein is not seen as a resource, you know, not seen as, as a land of resources that you can just take. The earth is seen as full of beings who offer us gifts that we can use if we accept those gifts in an honorable way in order to survive or to keep our families alive, to sustain our families and our communities. It's about being surrounded by a world of gifts, not a world of resources we are entitled to take. You will find by and large with um, anthropologists will say that tribal scale societies or tribal societies or small scale societies, the people who live in them are some of the healthiest people that we know of in human history. Um, they have really excellent health living these sort of lifestyles, whether it's as hunters or as horticulturalists or as hunter gatherers or a combination of those. There's such an active lifestyle, such a cared for lifestyle in these sort of communities as a general rule. Um, and such a happy lifestyle that people tend to live for very long lives. There may be high infant mortality rate. That's kind of a question mark. It's been an assumption, not really anything that's supported by direct scientific evidence that there's a high infant mortality rate. Um, but once people reach adulthood, it's obvious that people can expect to have very long life expectancies, longer even than the life expectancies we have in our industrial societies, which we often pride ourselves and we've advanced our um, our lifespans in industrial society. And it's true in one sense, um, when we compare ourselves to agricultural societies and in feudalistic uh, cultures where people were really oppressed and suffering greatly. Yes, we've improved our lifespans from that. Um, but when we compare industrial lifespans to tribal lifespans, no, we, we don't compare as favorably. The, the people who live in tribal societies lived much healthier um, anthropologists will even say happier and longer lives. In fact, one anthropologist, um, his last name is Solens. I can't remember his first name right now. Marshall? Marshall Solens. Um, he referred to tribal societies as the original affluent society because he said you had an abundance of free time. This was not about a hard scrabble existence. Yes, when you went out and harvested and gathered the stuff you needed to sustain your family and community, you worked hard. Um, but you also had large amounts of free time. And when you were working, you were working with friends and family, right? This wasn't like having to go off to a 40 hour a week job with strangers and then spend maybe, you know, uh, the minor part of your time with your family and your friends. You, you were spending all your time with your family and your friends. And as you did these harvesting or hunting activities, um, uh, the, av the estimation right now is in a hunter gatherer society, uh, around a whole year, on average, people would spend about 15 hours a week um, needing to provide for what they needed uh, to, to survive. And then the rest of the time was free time. Now, this depends on where you're at. Uh, for example, the Ojibwe here probably worked more than 15 hours a week during bearing season, um, during the sugar bush time in the spring, during the wild rice time in the fall. Um, so those, those would have been intensive times. But times of winter, times between harvest, those were times when you had just a lot of free time just to hang out and be like, yeah, just enjoy life or develop your creative side or, you know, tell stories in the winter time, um, all sorts of things. In fact, some people say the Anishinaabe up here 
I know Carl Galboy I'm thinking of, he's an Anishinaabe person who tells a lot of star stories. He says that the winter time was a time to be celebrated. Um, because though it was hard in many ways, it was also a time to allow for a lot of deep spiritual reflection and contemplation, the sharing of stories, a creative time to do your, um, you know, your, your, your sewing and your, there was all, all sorts of stuff, deed work when beads came along, quill work, all sorts of things that people would do during that winter time to just kind of develop their creativity and, and be with friends and family as well. But that happened, of course, during the good times too, the, the good weather times. Um, the goal of tribal skills, of tribal societies or small scale societies is to seek equilibrium with all relations. It is not about dominating the earth. It's not about dominating other people. This doesn't mean there wasn't war and there wasn't conflict because there certainly was. But as a typical thing, war that was uh, conducted against other people was not at all on the same scale as what you see with uh, civil, civilized or city, city based societies. And not at all what you saw with industrial societies. It was a much smaller scale war. Um, warring kind of thing. In fact, this is so marked that when Europeans came over to the Americas and they conducted war against some of the tribes, if they had some native allies with them, many times those native allies would stop. They said, whoa, what are you guys doing? You're going nuts. <laughs> you can't, you know, this is war, sure, but you can't go around killing women and children. You can't be devastating, annihilating entire villages. That's not, that's not what we do. So the native allies would often quit. Um, on the, the people, the Europeans that they had allied with, they said, this is, this is crazy. You, you guys are, are insane for the kind of warfare you're conducting. Um, so the idea by and large, despite any wars that were going on was to make sure that you saw equilibrium. The goal was equilibrium. Sometimes, like I said, there were, there was conflicts and you would have, um, have those wars. We talk about wars. Sometimes people might gather together and men might gather from two different tribes and, um, throw spears at each other, and when one person was killed, it would end the war. But of course, it set up, you know, the idea that now we got to go take revenge on that tribe. So eventually, you knew they were going to meet again and have a similar confrontation. Or with some of the Plains tribes out on Turtle Island here in North America, counting coup was considered more courageous than killing an enemy. Counting coups when you went up and you touched the enemy with a coup stick and made it and made it back, hopefully, but the idea was you had the courage to go up and touch an armed enemy with acoustic without killing them. So that was considered more courageous than killing somebody. So, you know, these different ideas of warfare. And on top of that, if you've heard of the game of lacrosse, that was a game that comes from the tribes here in North America. And it was a game, you know, it's an intensive game, can range cross country for, you know, over, over a mile, um, cross country. Um, and it was often a way to settle conflicts with people without resorting to war. So how, how great is that, that you can actually, instead of going to war, you play a sport? Wouldn't that be a great idea in this, in this day and age as well? Um, so that's all human-based, but there was also, you know, seeking equilibrium, I get to going with the human base too, within your community, making sure you, everything was in balance. And, and if somebody had a problem or an issue or, uh, conflict that you tried to settle it in, in a way that made everybody feel good and everybody feel happy and everybody feel as if their concerns were being heard, their side was being heard. You know, it was a constant seeking of equilibrium within the human communities, but also a, a constant seeking of equilibrium between the human community and <clears throat> the non-human community. So you don't want to, in, in uh, the words of today, we were talking about not over not not um, going over your carrying capacity for ecology on a given land base or not wiping out an entire species here or wiping an out an entire population there, but you're constantly seeking to be on good relations with the non-human members of your land's community because you were it wasn't just the humans that made up the community, it was the non-humans who made of the area that made up your community as well. And you wanted to be on good relations with them too. So much so that people saw them as family members, as part of their relatives, that we are all connected, we are all related in this way. And you treat family very differently than you treat um, strangers or resources, right? So it was a very, it was about trying to seek equilibrium, seek peace with all relations, human and non-human. And when things got out of balance, trying to figure out a way to get those back in balance again. 
Uh, we're going to, for each of these types of societies, I'm going to talk about population levels too. Uh, tribal societies have an equilibrium in terms of population. They are very aware that if there's too many people in a particular land area, that land won't be able to support them and they'll be damaging the land, of course, around there. Um, you, so you're, you're paying attention to that for survival. You're paying attention to how you're impacting the land as relatives. Um, and you're keeping your population stays relatively at an equilibrium. So how do people do this? Well, women in particular had a vast knowledge um, in these different tribal societies of, you know, medicinal plant-based birth controls. They also were very aware of their bodies and could practice, you know, birth control through, through that way. Um, they also, through the practice of nursing babies, we today, people think that nursing a baby for six months is a really long time. In a tribal society, you would typically nurse your child for four to six years, four to six years. And while you're nursing, um, and it, you know, it varies from woman to woman, but while you're nursing, you have initially almost a 0% chance of getting pregnant again. And as time goes on, your chance of getting pregnant um, decreases, it stay, stay, you know, increases, but um, the chance still is, is uh, greatly lowered if you're still nursing uh, a baby or a child. So nursing was one way that many women were able to keep their uh, the number of children that they had down. Uh, the Anishinaabe up here, according to Nick and Charlotte Hawkins from Lac de Flambeau or Waswaganin, the Anishinaabe up here typically only had about two children um, in their families. Uh, two, two child families was, was the norm prior to colonization uh, for Anishinaabe or Ojibwe people here in the North Country. I also want to make one last mention here before we move on. For tribal scale societies, use rights to land was very much respected, even as people did not believe they had the right to own a land. So what I mean by that, a lot of people look at tribes and say, oh, they just had this common ownership of the land, or they just believe land was to be held in common. And that's not true. Tribes were very aware of what their territory was and what the territory was of other communities or other tribes. They were very much aware, just like wolves are, right? If another wolf enters another wolf's territory, they better be on friendly terms or that wolf pack is not going to take too kindly to that strange wolf coming in. Um, so everyone, all relatives have this idea of here's our territory and we know we share it with the non-human beings that are out there. But when we're looking within our human communities, we recognize that this is so-and-so's uh, territory, over there is so-and-so's territory. Um, but, you know, that's one tribe's territory, that's another tribe's territory. We recognize that families have, this is that family's sugar bush, and that is that family's wild ricing patch, and we don't, we respect that. We don't think of it as something we go in and mess with. But that doesn't mean that we own that piece of land. Because the idea of owning a piece of land implies you own all the relatives, all the beings, the trees and the wolves and the squirrels and everybody who lives on that. And it was that last part that tribes were scratching their heads at when the colonizers came over and talked about this land ownership business. It's like, well, how can we sell you land? We don't own it. How can we say, how can we say we own those chickadees? How can we say we own that forest? We can't because we don't. So how do you even think, how do you have the arrogance to think that you do? Um, and that's where that idea of land ownership was a foreign and completely arrogant concept. Uh, it was considered an arrogant concept to be able to think that you had the right to claim that you own the land because claiming to own the land meant you were claiming to own all those beings on that land too. And that was something that the tribes did not, did not conceive of, did not um, believe in. It, it went contrary to their environmental and community values. This is an example of, we're going to be looking at this J-curve as we go through looking at the different societies. Um, so from, you know, 400,000 or 200,000, wherever you want to start, years ago to 10,000 years ago, this is where the global human population was at. We stayed at an equilibrium. Anthropologists estimate at approximately less than 4 million people on the planet. But, they, you know, of course, that's an estimate. But the idea is our population levels apparently stayed at this equilibrium for tens of thousands of years. And that's going to change with the advent of large-scale societies when those start emerging in different places. And we'll talk about that later. Um, so tribes, again, were territorial. 
but there was not much violent expansion. One thing I want to kind of make a nod to before we come to the end of this first part of the lecture is that tribal societies weren't just these people barely scraping a living out on the land, kind of bumbling around. So much of these stereotypes that we have in our heads that they tribal peoples don't really know much about the world. They're superstitious and cowering in fear and have a really rudimentary understanding of everything. That's so wrong. <laughs> so wrong. I can't even, anybody who knows even the littlest bit about tribal uh, cultures, uh, you know, knows how wrong that stereotype is. Um, indigenous knowledge is vast. Traditional indigenous knowledge is vast. And one of the ones that is so impressive, because, you know, as we go along and we move out of tribal cultures and away from those values, those cultures that do that, they lose so much of this knowledge that tribal societies and the people in them have. One of the things that I always find really impressive is the ability to navigate by the stars. And I have this map up here because if any of you have seen uh, Disney's Moana, you'll have an idea of where I'm going next. The Pacific Islanders are just one example of na natural navigators par excellence. They could navigate, they would go on these islands out on the Pacific Ocean and they would set off in their in their boats not to explore, not knowing where they were going. They would head into the into the trade winds, uh, what we call the trade winds today, with enough food to last so long. And once that food was halfway through, they would turn back and let the winds carry them home. But they would go out this way in foray like this, using the stars and the oceans um, to navigate, looking where the stars were, feeling the temperature of the water to, to, to calculate where land was, watching the seabirds when they appeared, all sorts of complex um, information that was being put together to explore the Pacific Ocean. And if you look at that, oops, let me go back a little bit. If you look at that Pacific Ocean, we can get back to the map, see how huge it is? I use this kind of map deliberately because the Atlantic Ocean is actually a lot smaller than the Pacific. And the Pacific Islanders were over here in this Pacific Ocean, exploring all, trying to find all these little islands there. And they did so successfully for so long. So just one example of, you know, the way people of the knowledge, indigenous knowledge people had. Going along with that star theme, this is a picture out in Wyoming of a medicine wheel. You find many of these medicine wheels across the Great Plains. You find things that are organized like this all around the world that come from tribal societies. The, this is a medicine wheel that is aligned with the solstices um, and aligned with different stars that rise at certain times on the solstices. And so it's very, very complex astronomical understanding of where the solstice is going to be, um, where, this, where the stars are going to rise. And this is just one example. We have stone circles even here in the Great Lakes um, that are underwater now in Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, and up in the Straits of Mackinac. Because they're underwater, they estimate that these must be about 10,000 years old because that's when there wasn't water there. It's when water was just starting to come, you know, back in as the glacier is retreating there. Uh, so they estimate these stone circles in the Great Lakes are about 10,000 years old. And uh, presumably, if they followed the same patterns of other stone circles around the world, they will be aligned with the stars or with the solstices or equinoxes and that sort of thing. So most people don't even recognize when the solstices are happening these days. Most people don't know how to navigate by the stars. Most people couldn't tell you what was in the night sky at any given time. In fact, sadly, more than 80% of Americans don't even know and have not experienced the Milky Way um, to the point that there was an instance out in Los Angeles when the power went out, people saw the strange cloud in the sky and they called the 911 services freaking out and they were told, well, that's not a gas cloud or an alien invasion. That's, that's just the Milky Way. <laughs> they didn't know that. So we are very alienated um, as we've left our tribal cultures behind uh, in different societies. We've lost so much knowledge and understanding, but it's there and it can, and some of that can be regained. But it's also really important to recognize that this knowledge is thousands and thousands and thousands of years in the making. Um, so when we lose it, we lose vast, vast treasure troves, vast, you know, millennia of human experience and understanding, vital understandings. 
All right, I'm going to stop here for part one. Um, I think we've talked plenty, uh, and I really want to spend particular time on taking a look at human history as a whole, and then also delving in deeply with uh, tribal societies or small-scale societies. And then in part two, we'll take a look at large-scale societies, uh, the corporatocracy, and a, a few other things, and wrap up this look at a short history of humankind, which at this point you might be thinking, I thought this was going to be short. I thought that meant really short. Well, short compared to what it could be if we really delved into 400,000 years of history, right? <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I will pick up this lecture in part two.